Welcome to Extreme Couture Mixed Martial Arts Training Center. I'm Randy Couture. This training video is designed specifically to extract some wrestling technique, especially collegiate wrestling and Greco-Roman wrestling, and show you how I've learned to apply that directly to the mixed martial arts fight game. So whether or not you're a, an accomplished wrestler who's trying to make the transition to this fighting sport, or a more traditional martial artist who wants to add some wrestling skills to your game, I think you're really going to enjoy this video. Range and transition are very important in the sport of mixed martial arts. You need to know if you're in long range and if you're in danger, you move into that range of exchanges, and then how do you transition from that range of exchanges to my favorite range, which is the clinch range. A real common tactic that we use is to parry and jab and move through the range of exchanges where a guy can hit you and you can hit a guy to get into clinch range where you can smother a guy and impose your will on him. Parrying a jab to clinch. A real common way, simple boxing tactic and technique is just to be in long range as you move into range of exchanges and the jab comes. I'm just going to parry the jab. You know where the target is. The target is your face. And from there, following that jab back, transitioning to clinch range. Simple. You can exchange jabs. transition to that clinch range. Sticky hands to clinch. Another simple tactic is using sticky hands, which is a tie technique. Okay, again, I'm parrying, waiting for that jab, and as that jab comes, I want to tuck my chin into my shoulder because a lot of times what follows that jab is that overhand right or that straight right hand, and I want to extend my lead hand to smother my opponent's hands or stick my hands to my opponent's hands, and then follow through that transition range into clinch. So as the jab comes, I'm tucking my chin, sticking my hands, and moving to clinch range. It's pretty easy from here to, to draw first blood or, or score. By off balancing my opponent, I'm pulling on this underhook, he's gotta adjust and step around my leg. As he does and moves his hips back, I can bring that strike into the gut with my knee. So I like that from sticky hands. As I transition, I can also score right off the bat. So. Elbow destruction to clinch. Another common way to transition through that exchange range is to use an elbow destruction. Your elbow is one of the hardest things on your body. A lot of small bones in your hands and feet, just one big bone there. All I need to do is cover, again I know where the target is, my face. So if I cover and move through that range, I can get to clinch pretty easily.
overhand to clinch. A lot of times I don't like to wait for my opponent to punch me. Okay? I want to be aggressive. I want to be the guy trying to hit him. And I really want him to mo stop moving his feet and cover his head. I do that by throwing a punch at his head. And that allows me that split second that he stops moving to transition to the clinch as well. I do that by throwing power at him, throw my overhand right or straight right hand at his head, getting him to cover and stop moving his feet and follow that right to the clinch. So again, in your boxing stance, as you move into that range of exchanges, you throw that right hand and follow it right to the clinch. So there's four simple tactics for transitioning through that exchange range to get the clinch and smother your opponent. So now that we can transition through that range of exchanges and get to the clinch, let's take a look at a few options once we get to the clinch to take a guy down or score. Basic pummeling. This exercise looks a little like swimming on dry land where I'm just concentrating on taking my opponent's underhook away from him. I'm using my hips to drive each underhook in as I re-pummel, re-pummel, re-pummel. All right. I want to make sure that I'm not leaning too much on my opponent. I want to stay centered, carry my own weight. I can push chest to chest and put a lot of pressure on my opponent there. Again, it's just a basic drill to develop sensitivity. Okay, now that we know we can transition and close the distance to the clinch and we have a basic sensitivity and understanding of, of pummeling in the clinch position, let's go over some takedowns from the clinch position. A lot of my favorite techniques come from this position, things that I've adapted directly from Greco-Roman wrestling. Greco is a unique style that not a lot of people get exposure to, so you might like some of these techniques. Duck under. Now, a lot of times the art in martial arts is being able to make those little predictions or manipulate our opponent into stepping where we want him to step or reacting the way we want him to, to react. And, uh, and so off of this basic pummeling drill, which we've already stated isn't terribly realistic, but is a good drill to learn sensitivity, I know that Ryan is gonna try to take my underhook away every time I get an underhook. As he takes that underhook away, basic skill, level change, duck under. Again, I just need to get close enough in here so I can get my head through. The lower I go, the more I risk getting choked. So I only need as much space as I need to get my head through here for this duck under. So a lot of times when I do duck, I want to, instead of digging my underhook, I want to let my hand float to the top. From here, this is the classic counter to the guillotine choke. Anytime I put my neck under my, my opponent's armpit, I risk getting choked. Classic counter is to be able to pull myself up and in and keep him from choking me. So again, off the pummel, he's gonna take that underhook away. I redirect his arm over my head, floated my hand on top, and now I'm right into this duck under position. There's several ways to finish from this duck under position. Okay, I can try and stand and choke right here. I can attack his hips from right here, elevate him and put him in the air, or I can simply drive into him and end up behind him in the standing position. A lot of options from that duck under position.
slide by. Another technique that I like a lot that I adapted directly from Greco-Roman wrestling is a slide by. And again, anytime I can make that prediction, I know he's going to re-pummel. As he re-pummels this time, instead of going under the arm, I'm going to slide my cheek and ear past his shoulder, changing levels, trapping his arm with my neck to his body and attacking the double leg. Now, I don't want to drive him straight back and end up in his guard or his half guard. I want to use this third appendage, my head, and drive through his body to take him down. So again, off of the pummel, slide by to the double leg. I know in this situation he's going to re-pummel hit that slide by. block. So we're working now off of this basic pummeling exercise that again isn't terribly realistic. You're not going to see two fighters pummel and swim basically for position. But it does develop that sensitivity we've already talked about in getting underhooks and taking underhooks away from my opponent when I fight into the clinch position. If I get to a more dominant position as we talked about dominant positions where I have an underhook, a dominant with my head on the same side as my underhook, or even if I'm stuck in an over-under position and I can make my opponent step, I can change levels, block his knee, and now I'm going to use my underhook to run his upper body over his lower body. Again, if I make him step, level change, and now I'm going to run his upper body over his lower body. What I want to be careful about here I don't want to get tangled up in his legs. As I run him over, I want to draw an imaginary line between our feet. And I want to stay on my side of the line, and he's going to stay on his side of the line. So as I run and explode through him, I stay on my side of the line. I'll slide right into cross-side position. Knee block is a low-risk technique. I know right here if I'm going to get it. If I don't get it, I'm right back up into the clinch. I haven't risked anything. I'm not getting choked. So that's a nice high percentage technique that doesn't put me in a lot of danger. Side trip. Another nice technique from this clinch position is an inside trip. If you've ever seen Matt Serra fight or Jay Haran fight, they both use this technique very effectively. Again, I need to make my opponent step. So I circle away from the leg, I want to trip, and that leg's going to come to me. It has to. Okay, now I need to change levels. Again, commit my hip and trap his foot. I need to take my head over my knee. It's the only thing that locks his leg in here. If my head's not there, he can step out of this technique and now I've put myself in danger. Okay. So that head needs to come right out and over that foot. From here, I'm just sagging my body weight through my opponent and tripping him to the mat. So I circle, make him step. Commit, inside trip.
single. Another technique from this dominant position. Again, if I can make him step on one side, I can knee block. If I circle and make him step on the other side, I can change levels and I can attack this high single. Okay, direct from college wrestling. Sometimes rather than hit the double and attack all of his power, it's easier to make him step and attack half of his power. Okay, I'm pulling on that deltoid muscle that's connected to the hip, to the foot, it's gonna come around. Now I can change levels, my free hand attacks, and I can pick up that single leg. Several options for finishing from this high single position. Against the cage, we've already discussed walking up and finishing the high single. The high single, I can also run the pipe where I'm creating space and dropping him over that missing leg. He'd like to be able to put his foot down and keep himself up, but I'm controlling his leg. Okay. A lot of guys have good balance. As I go to run the pipe and he hops around the corner, I might have to flare and change off to a double leg. It's a very good finish. You can change off to the double and flare from that high single as well. And the third option is that I can pop my head to the outside. Anytime I pop my head outside and under my opponent's armpit, I risk getting choked. So I have to weigh that option. I don't want to wait around here and see what's going to happen. The second I pop my head to the outside, I need to create that little panic in my opponent by elevating him and putting him in the air. I use my head to steer him to the mat and we come down with both our body weights. So there's a lot of options from that high single position. And we've seen guys get tied up in this over and under position in a lot of fights. It can be a hard position to get out of and create space and, and, and effectively do anything that's gonna change the position or the fight. I can stand here and stomp on Ryan's toes, knee him, shoulder punch him, and he can do the same things to me. This is a 50-50 position. Twisting body lock. Again, this is a 50-50 position. I don't like those odds, so I don't really want to hang around here. Again, if I, I can make a prediction that if I push into Ryan, 90 plus percent of the time, your opponent's going to push back. He's going to give you energy back. So I want to create that little bit of energy between us. As that tension builds up, the twisting body lock is a simple technique. I'm going to lace my overhook side under his elbow and put my palm right on his lat. I've already got an underhook and can have his lat on the far side. I want to commit my hips where my power comes from, my center, deep inside. So I'm up under his hips and lifting him. Okay, now it's just dance move. I'm going to pivot on my toes and twist. Pushing on the lat on my overhook, pulling on the lat on my underhook. Again, the more <clears throat> tension that builds up between us, if he doesn't resist and doesn't push back, it's not going to work. So you got to have a good partner. And in a fight, that's never an issue. He's going to push back, trust me. So as he pushes back, pulling, pushing, and twisting to put him on the, on the mat. Again, I like to lace under that elbow. See how his shoulder raises into his ear? Okay. That's twisting his upper body. I have to commit my hips. If I don't step in deep and commit my hips here, I'm not gonna have enough power to move his body weight. So that's very important.
off balance to a snap down. Another option, especially if I'm stuck in this 50-50 position, and he's got a little more dominant position, and he's pushing into me, is to off balance my opponent and snap him down. I'm starting by fishing my thigh inside of his thigh. I have an overhook. He feels pretty comfortable with his underhook. Okay, I'm just going to use my hip to break his balance. I'm going to bump him with my hip, keeping my foot on the floor at a 45 degree angle out. Okay. Again, if he's trying to push me to the fence or giving me some energy, I just need to meet that energy. Hold my own, hold my ground. And that tension builds up between us. As I take his base away, bump that leg out, I'm gonna pound on his shoulder blades, take a half a step back and create that space for him to fall into. So again, we're pushing each other, we're stuck here. I fish my thigh inside his thigh. Breaking his balance and capturing his head. Now from here we go to our submission series to dragging him to the mat. So chest to chest, 50-50. Fish my thigh inside his thigh. Overhook, underhook. Gonna create the space, the little black hole for him to fall into right between us. Break his balance. The more tension between us, the better. Push, he pushes back. Break his balance. I have to move out of the way. Create the space for him to fall into. Now I can capture his chin, capture his head, and drag him down and go to work. Sweep. The final technique I like from the clinch, especially from a dominant position, again requires me to make my opponent step. If I pull on his shoulder and circle away from the leg I want to attack, that leg's going to come to me. That's what I'm looking for. As that leg comes to me, I'm just going to, just like I'm trying to get lint off my mat, I'm going to sweep his foot. Okay. So I make him step, as the foot comes around, I sweep it, and he'll go down. Using my underhook to make him step, sweep the lint off the mat. I want to meet right where the friction is, right where his foot meets the mat. I don't want to kick him high, I don't need to kick him, okay, make him step, sweep. Okay. You can actually see that technique executed in a fight when I fought Rico Rodriguez uh, years ago, but it's a good technique. Again, low risk. If I don't get it, I haven't put myself in huge danger. And that's clinch takedowns. I don't know if there is an ideal form or background uh, for a, a complete mixed martial artist. Obviously wrestling works for me and, and that's the background that I chose. And, and I know several other wrestlers that, that have made the transition and, and seem to pick up skills well and, and have the right mindset and the, the right physical tools to, to be complete fighters. Uh, but I think that any background is, is possible to have that same thing. I've seen plenty of strikers that have been very successful, plenty of guys that come from more traditional martial arts backgrounds and have been very successful in mixed martial arts. So I think it's more a function of the athlete, his, his ability to kind of keep his ego out of the way, put himself out there and learn all the tools that he needs to be a complete fighter.
Common dominant position, single underhook. I want my opponent to reach all the way through, ideally grab that front deltoid, pull his elbow down and into him. Now I'm stuck here. Now he can dominate the position with his head position and trapping my free hand so I can't punch him with it above the elbow. Okay, another dominant position, double underhooks. You want to have them nice and high, up behind my neck, the higher the better, so I can't lock. He moves his lock to the middle of my back. I can lock over and take some control from him and maybe throw him or chuck him somewhere. So you want to have that nice and high or nice and low at the belt line where he can control my, my power and my hips. Those are the two dominant places for the double underhook. So there's some basic clinch takedowns. Now the other side of that coin is in the unattached position, being able to set up open takedowns. Now the days are gone when we as wrestlers could come into a, a fighting event and just take anybody down at will. Guys have cross-trained, they sprawl better, they're way better at stuffing takedowns and keeping fights in the standing position. So I realized that I had to learn the other things too. The better my hands are, the more effective my punching, not only do I pre protect myself better, but I can transition and make that guy think about something else, make him worry about getting punched in the head, and then transition and wrestle him, because that's obviously where I feel the strongest and the best. So the same thing is true for a striker. If his background is in that and that's where his strength is, the better his wrestling is, the easier it's gonna be for him to keep a fight standing and keep in that strength of striking realm. A jab to a double. Open takedowns. You got to be able to transition. We've already transitioned to the clinch. Okay. A lot of the same setups will work for transitioning to an open takedown. The first is obviously parrying that jab. I know where the target is. He's going to try and punch me in the face. I need to meld my boxing technique together with my wrestling technique. In wrestling, in order to take anybody down, I have to at least be an arm's length away. If I'm further than that, I'm not going to get there. Guy's going to be too fast. He's got too much space to change the angle and stuff that takedown. If I'm in an arm's length away, I can be hit. I'm in that range of exchanges, that same range that we had to transition through to get to the clinch if that's where we want it to be. Okay. So this time, instead of transitioning to the clinch, we're going to transition to an open takedown. I'm going to parry that jab. As I parry that jab, I start my level change and my penetration to close the distance and hit the double leg. Okay. One is that level change, penetration, and parry all happening at the same time. Two is to bring that trail foot up and drive my shoulder right up into his side and armpit. I don't want to be low where he can choke me and stuff me. I want to be here in the finished position as high as I can get. The third step is to drive off that outside foot and drive my head through his upper body to that double leg. Again, three steps. One, two, three. Okay, parrying the jab to the double leg. Now this three-step combination, pairing the jab to the double leg, is in this in instance, orthodox fighter versus orthodox fighter. If my opponent changes his stance, is in a southpaw stance, everything changes. I never want to shoot with my head towards that trail leg. I already in doing that, give him this nice angle that I have to then turn the corner and finish. The percentage of doing that goes way down. So I need to change my attack and I want to attack the near side, the closest side of his body. He's a southpaw now, so I'm going to still parry that jab, but I'm going to do it with the other hand. Okay, And it's two steps now. 
Parry the jab, level change penetration. There's one. And the second step is right across his body and putting him into that double leg. Okay? So, orthodox versus orthodox, it's three steps. One, two, three. Orthodox versus southpaw is two steps. One, two. Okay. right to a double. Now I don't know about you, but I don't like to wait around and see if a guy's going to punch me in the face. I like to be more aggressive, more offensive. So I'm going to come out and I'm going to try and punch my opponent in the face. Again, I need to make that transition through that range of exchanges. I'm looking for that split second in throwing that punch in his head that he's going to have to cover, protect himself, and stop moving his feet. That's going to allow me that half second time to transition to that double leg. So I throw the overhand right. Again, I have to meld my boxing technique and my wrestling technique. Everybody seen boxers bob and weave? In wrestling, we call that a snake. I'm snaking my head out of his armpit. Okay, I throw the overhand right. There's one, two, I bob and weave, come out under that armpit. And then number three is that step across. Okay. Again, I'm throwing the punch this time. I start my level change and penetration as I throw that right hand. One, two, three. Just like parrying the jab, everything changes when he switches to southpaw. The southpaw is vulnerable to a straight right hand. It's a great tool against the southpaw, but it's, in my opinion, more difficult to set up the double leg when his stance is switched. It can be done. You're going to have to drill it and, and get real comfortable with it. So I'm still going to throw that nice straight right hand, start my penetration and my level change, and in two steps, I'm going to blow right through my southpaw opponent. One. Two. Everything else is the same. Stance is switched, so I need to come out and attack the nearest side of his body. One, two. These are all some of my favorite techniques. You've seen this double leg takedown against Tito. You saw it against Chuck. I've used it in several fights. You can look it up on video. single leg. And that leads us to the next takedown from the open position, which is a single leg. And if Ryan stays in the southpaw stance, this is actually a very nice setup for a southpaw because I can use my jab and pop my opponent to distract him and take my power hand, my right hand, and snag that single leg and pull myself right in. So again, melding the wrestling and the boxing together as I stick that stiff jab in his face, the level change comes, I hook that knee and pull myself right into that single leg position. Very nice technique against an, a southpaw fighter and it becomes more difficult against an orthodox fighter. If Ryan goes to orthodox stance, obviously the jab isn't going to work 
and I want to be careful about reaching with my right hand. So what I can do is throw my right hand to distract my opponent and reach with my jab hand to pull myself into that single leg position. Not as effective in my opinion, but again, it still will work. You can drill it and you can make all these takedowns work from the open position. One of the things I had to figure out as a wrestler making the transition to fighting is how to adapt my wrestling technique and make it fit into fighting situations a little bit better. A perfect example of that is a basic skill in wrestling called level change and penetration. Obviously in level change and penetration in a wrestling match when a guy's hunched over protecting his legs and his hips, I got to get much lower, I got to touch my knees on the mat and I got to penetrate through that. But if he's standing upright in a fight posture, that changes. There's no reason for me now to go clear down there and touch my knees on the mat and try to come all the way back up into finish position. So I adapt my wrestling technique. I no longer touch my knees down there. And then we get this penetration where we're right up in to the finish position. Still a level change there. I'm still penetrating, but it's amended, it's shortened, and abbreviated to fit fight situations a lot better. So there's a look at some takedown technique and tactics, some of my favorite. And once you get your opponent established on the ground, I'm going to talk about some tactics from the ground that are first going to allow you to damage your opponent from this position. And if you get stuck in the guard or some of these other positions, you can change tactics, change positions, and improve your position to dominate the fight. Overhand from guard. A common thing from the closed guard is my opponent's going to try and tie up my hands so I can't hurt him. He can try to tie up my head, which I need to pummel and clear. He's also going to try and tie up my hands so I can't damage him with them. One of the things I like to do is just like ripping a phone book, I'm going to shoot one hand up into his chin to extend his head and pull the other hand out of his lock and that's going to allow me to bring it over in that overhand position and land a good shot. I also want to use my elbows. Again, one of the hardest parts of my body is the elbow. And so anytime my hands are tied up here, I can rotate my elbow over the top of his lock and bring it into his face, trying to get those cuts and, and, and land those shots that can change the fight. Open guard posture pass. Now, a lot of times from the closed guard, this guy's just locking himself into a beating, especially if I keep landing a lot of these shots. He's going to open his guard to try and change position. Really, from the closed guard, I only have to worry about two submissions. That's a guillotine, if I'm careless with my neck, or a kimura, if I let him get across my body. Everything else he's going to do, he has to do from the open guard. So I'm really just waiting for that guard to open. And the second that it opens, I'm going to explode and posture up with my hips. I don't need to look at his face. I know where his head is. By bringing my head down to look at him, my hips go back and it alleviates the pressure. It's not as heavy on him. I need to be heavy. I can feel my way in, pass, and settle. Now I have this great posture. I can bring down big shots and end the fight. Another common guard pass that I like, when that guard opens up, He's just to stand in his guard. 
I post my hand on his belly button so he can't move his hips too much. And I'm going to pass to his weak side, his left side. I'm going to post on his knee, walk around, and come right into side position. on hip control. From here, rather than rest my knee on his stomach, because he's an unstable platform, I want to attach my palm to his hip and glue my elbow to my knee. Doesn't matter where he goes, I have this elevation. I'm just going to keep filling that space with my foot, and I'm going to keep hitting him with big shots. So again, anytime I have elevation over my opponent, I can hit him with much bigger shots. As he turns and tries to single leg me, I can turn, change sides, and spin around. Keep him off balance, never let him get a chance to secure that single leg position. ride. common thing for guys to do is to turn and try and get out of this to go fetal. From here I can fall into a side ride position where I'm going to take my waist, deep waist hand and grab the inside of his flank or thigh. I want to keep my knee up in under his chest. He's tied in here with a deep waist. It gives me a free hand to kind of tee off on him. He's stuck here. It's hard for him to get out of this position. This can be a showstopper and a, a real good position to do some damage and end a fight. One of the quotes I use a lot, besides you're really only as good as the guys you sweat and bleed with, is that iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. It's a psalm from the Bible. And uh, I, I think it's very true. If, if, if you're not in a training environment where you're getting smacked in the head, you're getting tapped out, you're getting challenged on a daily basis, th then you're not getting any better. You're not improving. Uh, your workout partners are, are a very, very important piece of your progression as an athlete and, and the character that you're building as a person as well. So I think this, those are key components and, and finding that right place is, is a big piece of it. So there's a look at some ground and pound tactics and technique. Another common area that I end up in as a wrestler and an area that I like and probably the best submissions that I have are from the front headlock position. One of the common ones that we see is a gator roll or an anaconda choke to a gator roll. And you've seen this in the Mike Van Arsdale fight in several attempts and finally ended up finishing the fight. Anaconda choke from a gator roll. I want to make sure and keep my weight centered over my opponent's head and shoulders. Make him carry my weight. Now for the process of demonstrating, I'm on my knees on the mat, but I don't really want to rest there. I want my opponent to carry all that weight 
and take some gas out of his tank. I'm gonna fish my hand all the way through using this armpit to expose my palm in his armpit. From there, I can slide right in, grab my own bicep. How comes the gator roll part? A lot of times it's hard to just apply the choke from here to cinch it up. I'll drive my elbow through his armpit and roll my opponent. And now actually my hips, where all my power comes from, apply the choke. By walking my hips into my opponent, the choke gets applied. Straight front headlock choke. Another common front headlock choke is just that, a front headlock choke. And rather than fish my hand through the armpit, this time I'm going to go the other way, up under where I can lock this nice hard radial bone into that jaw set where that carotid artery is on my opponent. I'm going to make a blade and grab that so I can use my, again, my elbows and my hips to apply that choke. Once I get it locked on, I want to crowd my opponent and choke him with that front headlock. Front headlock choke can be very effective, especially with a solid barrier, where I can put his back or butt against the fence and he has trouble moving or changing the angle. quarter Nelson to a Dars choke. Another common tactic I like to use is a front quarter Nelson. Uh, it comes directly from wrestling. This guy's got a good solid base. It can be hard sometimes to maneuver him off of that base. If I lease, controlling his head again, lace my hand through, grab my own wrist, and I'm going to use all four of my fingers to attack his carotid, the tendons in his neck that, that protect his carotid artery. And by using my hip and bringing it to his side, I can take his base. Now I'm going to release my wrist and lace my hand under his head and slide right in to the dars. From here, I'm just settling my center and applying the choke. roll to a Dars choke. From this same front headlock position, I can roll into the Dars choke as well. Again, I'm going to go through the armpit to the far side of his neck. And from this front headlock position, I'm going to roll. And as we roll, I come right up on top with the Dars choke. Again, by settling the center of my gravity onto his neck, I'll get the choke. So there's three or four variations of a front headlock choke, the anaconda, the dars, the straight front headlock choke, that are great options, especially for wrestlers that most, most know how to do these front headlock chokes. Great options and great submissions.
Another situation we've kind of invented and, and adapted wrestling to from this clinch is to use a wrestler's collar tie and move my feet in dirty box. So I'm holding and punching, but I want to move my feet and force my opponent by this downward neck pressure to try and have to catch up with me all the time. And as he tries to catch up, he's walking right into my fist. I can always change hands. And again, dirty box. You saw that in the very first Belfort fight years ago, and everybody kind of coined the phrase dirty boxing then, and, and a lot of people have used it since then. Now, through the course of this instruction, we've covered a lot of offensive technique. Let's cover a little counter technique or defensive tactics, and we'll start with my favorite position, which is, you know, from the clinch and the underhook. Countering an underhook. If my opponent secures a good solid underhook position, this can be difficult to get out of. And I want to be careful about limiting how much I expose myself to being scored on or taken down. So nicely, we go where our head goes, our head's attached. So I want to grab that opposite ear. I'm going to post and block right on the outside of his, of his leg. And now I'm going to pull his head and work his head. I need to create space here. He wants to stay tight. I need to be able to re-pummel and get my arm out of here without exposing myself too badly. So again, I'm going to grab that opposite ear and I'm going to pull him over this block. And when I do, that allows me to rotate my elbow inside and come back to an inside position and re-pummel. So again, he's got a nice solid underhook. He's probably going to be attached to me. I'm blocking, grabbing that opposite ear and re-pummeling. double underhooks. Transition to another dominant position. Double underhooks, especially when it's nice and high up behind my head. This again can be very uncomfortable. I don't want to freak out. I don't want to panic. I don't want to try a big throw or do something. If this guy's good enough to take me down and earn this, then I've already screwed up and fell asleep and gave him the position. But if I settle in, lower my center, make him carry my weight, and then whichever side his head is on, I'm going to shuffle over and block again with my thigh, move his head, pull him over that leg, that block, to create some space between our chest so I can re-pummel. Okay, now I've changed the position and got to a better 50-50 or even better than that dominant position. From the underhook position or the double underhook position, a nice technique, and sometimes when I'm stuck here against some better wrestlers, a way I'll get out of this is to use my overhook, and I'll almost turn my back and kick like a mule. What I'm trying to do is hit my opponent with my butt against his hip, almost like an uchimata in judo. Doesn't matter, single underhook or double underhook. I have to commit my butt, I have to commit my hips, they should hit my opponent in the hips. If I'm really stuck in that underhook position and I'm going down, this is a, sometimes a last ditch but effective way to counter this position.
defending a single leg. Another common place we end up is a single leg. Okay? I don't want to let him capture my hip and start to take my center of gravity up. I'm going to go for a ride. I need to first control his hands, work on his grip, slip his lock to my knee. So now he's just picking up my leg. He's not picking up my whole center of gravity. I'm going to keep attach myself to this wrist and wait for him to adjust. I can keep my balance here a while. He's carrying weight. Okay, Wizard in so I can keep my balance. And I'm going to work on that grip. If I can pull and pop his grip, I get my leg back. Okay, Sometimes I can put my chin, or if he's tall, my head underneath his chin. Sorry, my shoulder or my head under his chin. And I can extend my leg and pull and break that lock. Okay, I want to get my leg back to the floor. Now I can circle out and clear or stay right in the clinch position. It depends on what my goal is. the head to the outside. Another nice option from this single leg position is this head position. If I let my opponent have head position, he can stay here a while. So I can reach up and move his head to the outside. Allows me to cover, potentially threaten him with a choke. And as I get to this position, now I'm almost more in a double leg. It's hard, easy for me to sprawl and put a lot of pressure on his arms and shoulders if he tries to hang on. Popping his head to the outside is a good option. kick over. Another option I have from this high single position is to trap his wrist. I'm not so worried about the outside arm as I want to lock him into my leg and so I grab his wrist that's, that's going around my leg on the inside. It's a little bit bigger commitment for this technique <clears throat> but sometimes that bigger commitment pays off. Once I lock him to my leg I'm going to step between his legs with my free leg and I'm going to sit to my butt and kick this leg over the top. And my opponent's gonna fly over my head and I'll come out on top of him. Like I said, a kick over, a little bigger commitment. Guy anticipates you're gonna do it and let's go. You're gonna end up on the bottom. But if you lock him in tight and kick him over, you end up in pretty good position. Obviously the counter to a double leg takedown is to sprawl. If Ryan's out in front of me and he's throwing that combination, I'm protecting him. He hits that shot. I need to take that lead leg back, cover his head, make him carry my weight. What I never want to do is rest my knees on the mat. It takes a lot of pressure off my opponent. Now we can start to find daylight and find a way out from underneath me. I want to stay here, centered over his head and shoulders, and I want to drive through my toes all the way through him. Make him pay for taking that shot. Make him carry that weight. Now once I get his shot stopped, I can control his hands. So he can't get his hands locked around the leg and suck it under me. 
Okay. Once that shot stopped and I've taken that energy out of them, now I can look to extend them, block, and spin behind into that side ride position. Those are some real common straight up counters and counter tactics for takedowns and clinch work. There have been several fights along the way uh, that have fashioned my game and forced me to look at things and analyze things. And I think in a lot of cases, those were the fights that I lost. You know, the Hizzle fight was a fight that I that I won, but I, I, you know, I suffered greatly from being kicked in this left leg a bunch of times, and it forced me to analyze what I was doing. I knew I didn't want that to happen again. Uh, I think a lot of times as athletes, when we lose it's easier to evaluate your performance and see the mistakes you made and make adjustments and, get, and, and become a better athlete and ultimately, I think, a better person through that process. That's sometimes harder to do when you win. You don't, you're not as you know, tough on yourself. You don't scrutinize because even though you won, you still made mistakes. There's still things you could have improved on, and we don't always go back and do that when we win. Well, we've talked about a lot of technique, covered a lot of different areas and how wrestling applies to the fight game. One of the things in the environment that I compete in a lot is the cage. Now the cage can be your best friend or your worst enemy. So I want to show some of the cage tactics that I've developed in my fighting style over the years. Now the cage is the confines to what we fight in and it can be used to cut my opponent off and, and eliminate his angle of escape. I know that about two and a half feet out from the edge of the cage is a black ring. If you look at any canvas from the UFC, there's a black ring there, and I can tell in my peripheral vision as I hunt my opponent down, when his feet cross that black line, that he's now had a limited angle of escape, and he's only about two and a half feet from the cage. That's my opportunity to attack. That's my opportunity to close the distance, whether that be to the clinch, or to throw an offense at him like a double leg, to ram him into the fence and trap him. Double leg rebound off the fence. The double leg, as I cut my opponent off and limit his ability to get away from me, I can either parry his jab and penetrate to that double leg, running him to the cage, or throw that overhand right and slip to the double leg, running him to the cage. Most people stop at a solid barrier. We're gonna hit that double leg, get to the cage and stop here. And as you can see, this thing's flexible. There's a rebound to it. I want to use that rebound to my advantage. So when I throw that double, I want to use that rebound to help put my opponent in the air and finish that double leg. The more he resists, the higher he's going to go, the bigger that impact when he hits the ground. So again, using that rebound to put him on the deck. single leg takedown. A lot of times I get here and we're stuck here. My double leg didn't go the way I planned. I've still got the solid barrier to trap him here. From this position, instead of hanging on the double and using all the strength I have to try and pull his legs out, I'm going to change off. And when I change off, I'm changed to a high single. And unlike wrestling, 
I don't want to just stand up with my opponent's legs, or leg in this case, because he's got free hands. He's going to start making me eat leather, and that generally doesn't taste good. What I want to capture is his hip. It's easy for me from here to switch my lock from the double to the single. Okay, I've got him trapped on one side with my head, on the other side with my hand. And now I'm just going to slide right up so I can feel his cup and walk his hips up. Now I just need to create a hole for him to fall into. I use my head to steer him to the mat. Okay, that's a high single using the fence and that solid barrier to help me. Okay. This barrier can also be good for clinch control. If I close the distance and get to the clinch, I've got my opponent trapped with my head on one side and that hand on the other side. Whether it be an underhook up high or a leg attack down low. Inside trip. Now, especially if I'm in on a double leg, a lot of times my opponent's going to shift his weight down, bring his feet out, and try and keep me from pulling that double leg out. In doing so, he creates some space which allows me to lace my ankle inside, and now I can circle him towards that missing leg for an inside trip. A fairly simple technique and I've used it in several fights but anytime he gets his feet out away from the cage to try and keep me from taking him down again I can lace in here now I'm going to pivot and circle him towards that trapped leg Ground and pound top position. Once we hit the ground here, especially against the cage, becomes an elevation game. The guy who gets the most elevation is going to have the biggest advantage. Okay. The cage can be a huge hindrance or it could be a huge help depending on your perspective and the position that you're stuck in. As I get on the ground here, I want to keep my head clear, I want to keep my hips in, I want to stay postured up. The more I'm postured, the bigger the shots. And, and the more controlling I can be. I can use this fence to my advantage. Whichever side my opponent tries to go to escape, I want to raise that opposite leg, and I want to crowd him with my hips towards his head. And the more stacked and elevated I get, the easier it is for me to trap him here. He changes his head to the other side. I'm going to change sides. Again, crowding with my hips, posturing up, and trapping him again. Elevation and wall walk from the bottom position. He, on the other hand, 
wants to try and get off of his back. As long as he's flat on his back, he's going to be stuck here, and he's not going to like the fence very much at all. He gets to a shoulder, that's better. He gets to an elbow, that's better. He comes up to a hand, that's even better. Now he can start to use the cage to walk himself up back to the standing position. So depending on your perspective, the cage can be a help or a huge hindrance. You need to use it to your advantage. I think wrestling is is a very big piece of the MMA puzzle. Um, that it can't be neglected. Just like striking can't be neglected, the jiu-jitsu and the ground skills can't be neglected. There's there's a transition uh, a transition skill and and uh, the takedowns and and all the other things that come from wrestling that that directly apply to this sport. And the guys that overlook it or, or don't choose to spend any time there have have a glaring weakness, and that's 